Un gran placer para nosotros contar con la visita de la doctora Mira Pollard, que va a estar en Uruguay durante un mes. La visita se enmarca en un programa de, de cooperación entre los Estados Unidos y Uruguay, que es eh, mediante un fondo administrado por la Embajada de los Estados Unidos, un fondo altamente competitivo que permite traer a un miembro de una organización de gobierno de los Estados Unidos en temas que sean considerados estratégicos. Bueno, tenemos eh, la gran suerte ¿no? de ser favorecidos. Este es el, el segundo caso en 10 años que Uruguay puede traer a alguien. Son fondos por los cuales compiten muchos países. Esta es una, una propuesta del Instituto Saras y del CURE de, en la línea de poder eh, contribuir a la resolución de, de problemas eh, complejos entre los cuales se encuentran los manejos de recursos acuáticos en Uruguay. Entonces la idea es eh, aprender de las distintas experiencias que, están, que se están haciendo en otros lados, en particular la experiencia de la EPA, la Agencia de Protección Ambiental de los Estados Unidos, ver eh, cómo ellos han organizado lo que es el, el manejo y la gestión de los recursos, ver qué cosas podemos trasladar a nuestra realidad, qué cosas no debemos trasladar también a nuestra realidad. Y bueno, en ese marco entonces se da esta, esta visita de la doctora Pola al Uruguay. Y en particular... En Maldonado queremos eh, que ya conozca lo que es la, la realidad de, de la situación del agua en el departamento y ver también cómo podemos intercambiar esos conocimientos. Y para eso contamos con el apoyo de la Unión de, de Vecinos, que bueno, están acá, de, de Punta Ballena, la Una del Diario y la Una del Sauce, que en particular permitieron la, la visita de Diamina a Maldonado por esta semana. Y bueno, les cuento que la. La agenda continúa con un curso de posgrado que va a editarse en Montevideo, el cual van a participar no solo estudiantes, sino técnicos de distintas instituciones, de la DINAMA, del AGUA, de la OCE y del LATU, además de, de estudiantes de distintos programas de posgrado que están trabajando en estos temas, por lo cual esperamos que esto entonces se multiplique bastante más allá de, de este año. Y luego haremos un taller con DINAMA y el INEA a fines de septiembre para discutir también cómo lograr mejorar la calidad de, de nuestras aguas mediante la mitigación de los impactos y la producción agropecuaria. Para eso vamos a contar con la experiencia de Amina y también de otro investigador norteamericano que está trayendo en línea. Así que bueno, eso es un poco el, el programa que, que tenemos. Muchísimas gracias, Amina, por participar, sumarte a, la, a nuestra invitación. Thanks very much for joining and accepting our proposal. Y bueno, la presentación, el texto está en español. También habla un poco de español, pero va a presentar en inglés. Gracias. Y, y bueno, yo puedo actuar de, de traductora si hace falta para las preguntas o si, si hay algunos aspectos que estimen que sea bueno aclarar más. Felizmente me ofrezco. Si no. No, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, I tend to speak quickly, even when I'm at work in the US. So please let me know if I'm uh, going too fast or if I am not being clear about something. Um, so thank you so much for having me here. Um, I was asked to give a few words today on. Um, some of the governance that we have for managing water quality in the United States. Um, and I hope to be able to share that with you so that if there are things that you like about that system, um, maybe you can think about taking them and improving them and implementing them here in whatever way seems reasonable for, um, for Uruguay. Um, and you'll see we also have some challenges that we share in common that we can maybe work on um, together. And I hope to take home some of the approaches you all are um, proposing for dealing with some of the issues. So today I'm going to cover three objectives. First, I'm going to um, introduce the Environmental Protection Agency, give you a little background about what it is and how we operate. Um, and then I will. Um, describe our water quality management strategy in the U.S. and talk about how we um, 
how we are actively managing our waterways and how those partnerships work to do that. And then finally, I'll note some of the challenges and successes that we have. So the Environmental Protection Agency um, is an organization that I work with and they sponsor me. Um, we have uh, people who are attorneys, a lot of attorneys, um, scientists and um, policy makers and then a variety of support staff. So we have um, 14,000 employees um, who work on behalf of the environment for the U.S. Um, we have a headquarters, which is pictured here in Washington, D.C., and then we have a distributed system of management. So we have um, offices in 10 regions across the U.S., and that will become important later when, you, when we talk about our partnerships. We also have 16 laboratories that we work with, and they provide us scientific information to help us make environmental decisions. Um, even though it sounds like a large agency and a lot of people, um, we rely a lot on our partnerships, and that's in part because a lot of the... Um, Excuse me. We rely a lot on our partnerships because we have a belief that, um, that you can get a lot of information from the local community and that a lot of times with a country as large as ours, uh, we need to have information about what's going on locally to make um, informed decisions. So we work with uh, local governments, including the states. So we have 50 states that each have an environmental organization. Um, and then we also have tribes, so these are our indigenous populations, and I think we have um, 562 recognized um, indigenous groups, and the national government um, recognizes their land as being um, their land. So we work with them um, to help the deal with environmental issues on their land. Uh, we also work with industry because they're an important partnership for us. Um, and for managing the resources because they oftentimes have a lot of resources and have a very um, vested interest in um, maintaining them. Uh, we work with um, environmental organizations and then, of course, citizens. So just a little history on the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, in the U.S., in the 1960s and before, we had a tremendous amount of pollution in our waterways. Um, mostly just excessive uh, nutrients, a lot of chemicals in our waters, um, and a lot of pesticides. And it was uh, having a tremendous effect on organisms and on human health. In 1962, Rachel Carson wrote um, Primavera Silencia, <laughs> Silencia. Um, and this really brought um, information <coughs> about um, sort of the consequences of environmental pollution to the forefront of both policymakers and uh, the public. And that outcry really led to um, some mobilization in environmental issues for us in the US. Um, so much so that in 1970, um, President Nixon, um, our president at the time, um, developed or signed the, um, the National Environmental Policy Act. And that set forth a, an expectation in the US that um, anyone dealing with the government, including government agencies, would have to think about the environment before they have some big action. So you have to develop some sort of impact statement um, to have an idea about what you're doing to the environment, and that went broadly to all agencies as well. So just um, thinking through environmental impacts was going to be an important part of all uh, political decisions moving forward. Um, and then in 1970 as well, um, the EPA was formed to um, serve as, as one of the main organizations that would help manage uh, environmental policies across the U.S. So the mission of the Environmental Protection Agency is to protect human health and the environment. Um, so uh, we have a very big focus on human health issues and making sure that there aren't or trying to um, reduce the consequences of environmental pollution on human populations. Um, our other, the other part of our mission is to focus in on natural resources and protect them. Um, 
we're primarily concerned um, with our mission. Our mission states that we are primarily concerned with water and air issues. Um, land is often dealt with by um, people who own the land or other um, agencies. Within EPA, we have an Office of Water, um, and this is just based on the understanding that water is one of our essential resources. It's one of the few requirements that we have as, as um, animals to have water as one of the essential things to keep us alive. Um, and even though it seems like when you look out, especially here, when you look out over the wonderful ocean and you see the whales, um, that we have a lot of water in the world, when you start to pull it off of the earth, um, we don't have as much as we would think. Um, so if you can see this graphic, it's uh, the earth and all of the water on the earth is that first dot here. Um, of that, 2.5% of the total water is fresh water, so that's a very small proportion of fresh water. And of that, most of it is contained in glaciers and ice and um, groundwater, not available um, regularly for us. Uh, of the 2.5%, 1.2% uh, of the available fresh water is in our lakes and rivers and streams. So that's a tremendous lake, which I don't know if you can see the tiny dot here, um, but that represents the amount of water that we have, um, and we have to take care of it because we rely on it. So that's the mission of the organization that I work in, in the Office of Water, is to um, understand that it's a, a vital resource and to try to protect it as such. So we have two ways of dealing with water management in the U.S. Um, we have the Safe Drinking Water, Safe Drinking Water Act, um, and that is an act that is really focused on um, making sure that we have public water supplies that are ready for people. Um, so it goes somewhat from the source of water to the tap and make sure that there are um, plans in place to have clean water. We have another act that deals more with the source water aspects and that's the Clean Water Act, and that's really the main uh, pollution control act that we have in the U.S. The two, of course, work together, ideally, where you have um, cleaner source water, and then you don't have to do as much active work um, and costly work to have safe drinking water. Uh, but um, sometimes there are um, areas for improvement in that relationship. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the Clean Water Act uh, because we focus in my group mostly on protecting source water areas um, and our lakes and streams and wetlands. So just some history of regulations in the U.S. Um, it seems like we've had water management policies in place for a very long time, uh, but that's, and that's sort of the case, but um, not, not always. Uh, so we have the Rivers and Harbors Act, and that was developed in 1899, and that was an act uh, that was our first sort of ma water management act, and it was developed primarily to keep navigable waters open. So they were telling people, well, you can't dump into this river so much that you prevent overdraft. That was the essence of the rivers. Um, after that, people were interested in maintaining clean water, uh, but they sort of developed uh, laws that were piecemeal and nothing comprehensive. And so we have three um, acts that were supposed to help control water pollution and they help us step towards it, um, but they weren't really um, comprehensive and they were usually uh, reactionary rather than proactive. Um, because of that, we a lot of these laws weren't actively they were on the books, but maybe not enforced. Um, and so we had some issues. Um, even though we had those four laws you know, um, on the book before um, 1969, um, we had events that galvanized the people um, in 1969. Um, and this occurred on a river that was very contaminated in the United States. It had um, just vast amounts of contamination. It caught on fire. Um, it was recorded to catch on fire at least 13 times. 
um, between um, in a 100 year period. So it was just regularly catching on fire. Um, and that was sort of a problem for the local population, but unfortunately they weren't um, really listened to about the importance of water catching on fire um, until this <coughs> picture was taken um, in 1969 by a popular magazine, it's a Time magazine. Um, and this is uh, the river water on fire um, and people trying to put it out with more river water. Um, so it was uh, one of the events that really galvanized a lot of interest amongst the public. And in that case, the public started asking their decision makers, why is our water catching on fire? And um, it sort of changed the way that we deal with water management now. Um, so what happened after that is that there's an entire presentation, um, is that the Clean Water Act started um, to be developed in Congress. And this is really our primary water pollution act that we have now. And it the, the, forms the structure of how we deal with water management. Um, our national objective is to restore and maintain the uh, biological, physical, and chemical integrity of the nation's waters. Um, it was given an interim um, objective, an interim goal, uh, recognizing that restoration was difficult. And they said that in, by 1983 we needed to have all the waterways better, um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, it set up a system of partnership where we have uh, the EPA, the national organization, developing a lot of the guidance um, and regulations and then um, helping to, to guide um, our other critical partner in water management. And that is our states, tribes, and um, territories. And they really have the authority to implement all of the Clean Water Act regulations. So it's a system that is partnership built in to the system, in part so that we can hear what's going on locally. Um, local politicians are, or local, local decision makers in the U.S. are more, uh, there's a seat here, here. Um, local decision makers in the U.S. are more responsive to local um, groups, and so it's a way to maintain some of the um, interests of different levels of, of governance in the structure. And so I'll just walk you through sort of the framework so that you can understand how we deal with water management. Uh, one of the first things that happens is that people need to set goals for waterways, and it sounds really simple, um, but it typically uh, isn't as simple of a process as we would hope. And so these goals are supposed to identify, sorry, um, how we want to use a waterway. So um, some of the examples would be for drinking water, um, for swimming, for fishing, um, any set of goals that the state or lo local government um, wants to identify. There are some limitations. Um, we don't allow any water to be, um, to have a goal of, of a trash receptacle. Um, that's not acceptable. Um, and almost all of the waters have a minimum standard of swimming and fishing. So those are um, sort of the baseline of where, of how we have goals. Um, these goals are meant to be um, aspirational. So there's something you should try to work towards. Um, and they are, once they're developed, they go into the local legislation. So they're on the books and uh, permanent. The next step that we have um, <coughs> is to um, develop standards and criteria that help us to realize the goals um, that we have for each waterway. And the, the standards are meant, I'm sorry, <laughs> the standards are meant to um, translate the goals into measurable objectives. And so those are supposed to help us um, communicate what it is that we're, that we're trying to achieve with that waterway. Um, we have two ways of, of thinking about them. Uh, in the early days, we talked more about um, sort of 
qualitative goals because that seemed to be sufficient. And so a qualitative goal could be that we want our waterway to be um, you know, pretty good, free from bad conditions. Um, could also be that um, we want communities that are um, balanced with indigenous populations. So we don't want to see much change. But as you can imagine, that leaves a lot for interpretation. Um, and administration changes, and suddenly what, what do you mean by a community in equilibrium? Um, it's a very difficult thing to, to move towards when, when society is changing. And so more recently we've been um, encouraging our states to develop goals that are numerical. <laughs> and these are much more, uh, some would say stringent, <laughs> but others would say easier to communicate. So we're clear about what we're talking about. So um, in, a, in this example, um, we might say that our lake needs to have at least five milligrams of oxygen on average over a seven day period. And so that gives you something really specific to target and um, allows both <coughs> managers to talk about that with the public. And presumably that is linked to some, um, to some goal that is communicable as well. Uh, the next phase is like the favorite phase and the one phase that I thought I would be doing for most of my career, which is being outside, monitoring. Um, Turns out that is one small part of the process. <laughs> um, but sometimes we need to have information from our water bodies, um, and that <coughs> helps us when we have um, when we need to know sort of um, whether what is causing problems, um, whether we have the state of our water resources, uh, potential and real threats to the waterways, and um, also helps us to identify ways of, of dealing with some of those threats. Uh, we have a, a sorry, we have a, a plan. It's in and out. Next time. <laughs> um, our, our monitoring plan is something that I'm going to talk about with folks here over the next week um, or with, until the end of this month, really. Um, and over the, the many years of monitoring, we've been um, able to hone in on some of the aspects of a monitoring plan that really help it to be successful. Um, this is in part because we have 50 wonderful states all developing their own monitoring plans. Um, so we have an opportunity to see different um, aspects of monitoring plans that work <coughs> and those that aren't working so well. And so the three aspects that seem to rise to the top include um, having a good plan, seems so simple, um, the careful implementation, <laughs> the um, informed communication, and all of those aspects really help to have a monitoring plan that is, um, both, I'm just thrilled with so many people coming. Those having those aspects of a monitoring plan really help us to have something that we can understand and communicate to people, um, and uh, to communicate not only within that monitoring community but out to scientists, to decision makers, and to the public. And so we always have. Um, something we can come back to to say, well, this is the decision we made, and here's why we made it, and oops, it might have been the wrong one, but at least you know what decision was made and how to move forward. Uh, the, the next step that we have is that um, the states who've been doing essentially all of the heavy lifting um, for our, our, our water quality management framework um, then need to report the results to EPA um, this is their favorite thing to do. Um, so they need to report two types of information. Um, first, they provide information about the quality of all of the water bodies um, in their state, um, locally. And so it's important for us to, to have an idea about how many of the waterways they're actually assessing um, and how many they aren't. So that we're clear when we're communicating that um, if someone sampled one lake and it looked great, that's great, um, wonderful, keep moving on. 
but at least we know that 99% of the lakes were not sampled, so we don't have any information about those. Uh, so that's the first piece, is um, getting an idea about the proportion of systems that they have actually assessed. The second piece of information that they need to provide um, in this first step is an assessment of whether those systems are, um, in this language, good or impaired, or somewhere in between. In that way, um, that gives us information to know how those states are doing. Uh, the second part of that, um, of the information that they need to provide, is for the systems that are um, considered impaired or degraded, uh, the local government needs to let us know um, why it failed its water quality standards. And so this allows for um, clarity and transparency with the decision makers, with the scientists who are uh, oftentimes doing the work, and with uh, the public when they have questions about the waterways locally. And so in this example, this is from um, Minnesota's, uh, one of our states, uh, uh, reports coming back to us, uh, and they had, I think it was 515 systems that were did not meet water quality standards. 515 new systems that didn't meet water quality standards, <coughs> and over 4,000 um, rivers and lakes that uh, were uh, not good. Um, <laughs> and they had to tell us that in this proportion of them, um, they had problems with mercury, so the fish had too much mercury. Uh, they had some um, pathogens that were running off. Um, nutrients were too high in some systems. Uh, so this is one of the ways that each local government provides us information that is uh, clear and transparent and required. Um, and so it's, it's uh, one of the things in our system that I think works uh, pretty well when we have uh, so many disparate, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'll just have lots of those pictures. Um, once we get those lists from each of the local governments, uh, EPA rolls them up to have uh, national information about stressors so that we know how to move policy forward and so that we can communicate to our decision makers. Uh, and so this is the list that is currently on our website. So I believe it's from the 2014 assessments coming in. And one of the things that we can see here over time is that uh, now we're dealing a lot more with uh, diffuse pollutants. Uh, and, and so we have a lot of our, in this case I think it's, yeah, it's rivers and stream miles, a lot of them are aff affected by uh, pathogens, um, sediment, nutrients, mercury, things that are more difficult for us to manage um, in our current framework. Yes. Do you have longitudinal information to see what's trending up? We do. Like, for for you know, like metals. Yeah, so we do have that information. One of the challenges that we have, so we have it sort of as a group for metals. Um, we don't have the speciation at times because as, as each state has to come up with its own monitoring plan okay. and so they can choose what they monitor for and how they measure it. And it creates um, one of the tremendous challenges that we have with this framework is uh, trying to balance the flexibility of, of having um, local management schemes yeah. and then trying to bring things together nationally. I was just wondering if aluminum is trending up as it has in um, the Mount Shasta snowpack and stuff. And I think we would see that more so in some of the local data sets because it has, because some of the country in the U.S. doesn't have a lot of snowpack. Um, but we do have, especially our states have a wealth of information um, over time. Mm -hmm. um, the next part of the plan is one where people spend a tremendous amount of time, and that's to uh, develop and implement a mitigation plan for degraded waters and a um, anti-degradation plan for good waters. Um, so we have this, this system of uh, once you tell us that you have 4,000 water bodies that are degraded, uh, you're supposed to do something about that. Um, and one of the ways that we deal with that is with uh, what we call a total maximum daily load. 
And this tells us the amount, or what the, the local government tells us, is the amount of a, pollution, of a pollutant that can be added to a system <coughs> before it exceeds its water quality standards. Um, so it's a way of saying that you can add, like collectively, maybe we can add five milligrams of phosphorus to a system before it flips over to being um, in a bad state. But you have to come up with a way of allocating that five milligrams for all of the people who want to use the land around the lake um, and identifying who's putting in what and how much they should be allowed to budget for additions. Yep. Oh. <laughs> um, it's a system that takes a long time for people to, uh, to move forward with. So this is a process that can take our local governments um, eight to ten years to return to us um, because they have to bring in stakeholders. Um, they already have the standards in place, but uh, at times stakeholders aren't pleased with the budgeting and allocation. So um, it's one of the, the challenging parts um, is coming up with a budget, which I think is um, an interesting approach to trying to manage waterways, but also um, trying to get people to adhere to the budget. So once they have the budget, they have to submit it to EPA for approval. Um, and EPA can approve it, which would be great. Um, if EPA doesn't approve it, then um, the national government will develop a plan for you. And as you can imagine, that's not um, people's favorite <laughs> response. Um, but it's something that, that we try to do because we recognize that, um, that it's a challenge to manage waterways without having something in place. Um, so we have two types of, uh, of, of approaches for dealing with these uh, maximum daily loads. One is, is an easier approach for us, and that is to have, um, if you have a point source discharge, it's much easier for us to go to the end of the pipe and to say, all right, this is obviously too much, now please stop, and here's a fine. Um, so that's one way of, of approaching these. Uh, the second um, situation that we often deal with and are dealing with more and more are for uh, diffuse sources of pollutants. Um, and in those cases, we try to deal with that by um, having best management practices and asking people to plant buffers or develop some plan for reducing inputs into the system. Um, this is one of the areas where we're really struggling to, um, to, to manage our systems in a way that is, is <coughs> successful. Um, we have, as, you'll, as you saw, um, most of our stressors right now are diffuse um, stressors. And so it's one of the things that we're able to highlight with our list of stressors. Um, and then we need to get people on board with uh, managing their waters in a very different way. Uh, the other part of, of the um, budgeting scheme is for anti-degradation. So we spend a lot of time talking about our polluted waterways and what we want to do to help improve those polluted waterways. Um, there's also a recognition by a few, um, a few very loud voices uh, that we don't want our high quality waters to slip down into mediocrity. Uh, so we have policies to prevent the deterioration of those waterways. And so um, these are treated in some ways more stringently than any of our other waters. So people who identify waters as being high quality will then have a very high bar to meet. Um, and it's very difficult to get permission to add um, nutrients or uh, anything to those waterways. Uh, and then, this process of monitoring, providing results, and communicating information, and then developing a management plan loops around every two years um, and is a never-ending loop um, into perpetuity of the US. And uh, it is uh, the responsibility of the states to keep that going with the help of EPA. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, the goals and the standards are pretty much set, and they're on the, on the law books. 
And so that's what you need to aim for. And then we just try to improve incrementally. But it's definitely um, a process that's a little bit slow and a little bit challenging. Um, some of the challenges that we have in sort of that, that framework of dealing with uh, water quality. Uh, we are very fortunate in the U.S. to have a very large land mass in 50 very um, interesting states. Um, and each of them develops something a little bit different. So just managing the differences amongst the 50 states is a challenge for a national organization. Uh, one of the ways that we've uh, dealt with this in the structure of EPA is to have these 10 regional offices and they sort of serve as the intermediary between uh, the local governments and uh, the folks in headquarters. Uh, another challenge for us has been that uh, because each state develops their own monitoring program, well, develops its own questions, and then has a monitoring program to address those questions. Um, that means that we don't have uh, standards for um, sampling or analysis that are common across the country. Um, it can be a little worse than that because we can have some states that focus almost entirely on lakes, other states that focus almost entirely on streams. Um, the challenge for us <laughs> at EPA is that we are asked questions at a national scale. And so um, we're getting all this great information locally. They have a lot of really uh, detailed information about their waterways. Uh, but when our decision makers, um, namely Congress in the US, ask questions 